I have been uh, given the task of talking about science in the 22nd century, which is, of course, impossible. And uh, I will try, nevertheless, to give a sense of how impossible it is. And I'll wait for my slides to show. So, like, there we go. Okay. To, to give you a sense of how difficult it is to anticipate the future, I want to talk about the past, in a sense. And I want to go to one of my favorite pictures. Actually, all of these Hubble Space Telescope pictures are my favorite pictures. This is one of the more recent Hubble Space Telescope pictures. The Hubble Deep Field is actually the ultra-high spectral resolution Hubble Deep Field. But every image, every dot in this image is not a star, but a galaxy. There are 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe, each containing 100 billion stars. When we look out at these galaxies, the nearby ones are perhaps one billion light years away. That means it takes the light a billion years to get from there to here. The faintest, dimmest, bluest ones are perhaps eight billion light years away. That means the light left from them eight billion years before today which is about three billion years or so before our sun even formed. And in fact, that means that most of the stars in those galaxies in this present image are gone. Our sun will have a lifetime of 10 billion years. Many of those stars no longer exist. When we look out at the sky, we're doing cosmic archaeology. This image, as amazing as it is, is recent. 89 years ago, a single human lifetime ago, almost the time when Rita Moreno was born. The universe consisted of a single galaxy. That's it, as far as science was concerned, our Milky Way galaxy. And it existed in an eternal universe that was empty and infinite. That was the image of the universe merely 89 years ago. And now we know we live in a universe that not only has 100 billion galaxies, but it's expanding and began in a fiery explosion, the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, which really happened 13.8 billion years ago. Some people in my country think it happened 6,000 years ago, but they're wrong. We want to try and look back, and as the science of the 22nd century will involve potentially trying to understand where our universe came from and how it began. Now, if we try and look back, we, this is an image, this is as far back as we can look. This is what's called the cosmic microwave background. When we look out at the universe, you'd think if the universe is 13.8 billion years old, that if you looked out 13.8 billion years away, you'd see the Big Bang. And in principle, you could. But between us and the Big Bang, there's a wall. Because the early universe was hot. As we go back in time, the early universe was hotter and hotter and hotter. And at a time when the universe was 3, 300,000 years old, the temperature of the universe was 3,000 degrees. And at that temperature, matter like the matter in this room cannot exist. Protons and electrons are torn apart into a plasma, and it becomes opaque to radiation. So if we try and look out, it's like looking out in this room. We can't see past the walls. When we look out at the universe, this is as far back as we can see. This is the early baby picture of the universe when it was 300,000 years old, and this in the cosmic microwave background, these little lumps here that you see are the lumps created at the beginning of time that would later collapse to form all of the galaxies and all the stars and all the aliens and everything in the universe. But that's as far back as we can see. We want to go back to the beginning of time. How can we do that? Maybe by the 22nd century we'll know how, but we're beginning to do that now because we're looking for something that can pierce that hot early universe and make it all the way to us. Light can't do it. But there's something else that interacts much more weakly, gravity. And at the beginning of time, the intense energies of the Big Bang, we think, created gravitational waves. Every time you move your hands, Einstein told us that you're disturbing space and creating a disturbance that would go out. In fact, if a gravitational wave was going through this room, it would kind of look like this now. It would be coming out of the screen. And what it does, a gravitational wave is a disturbance in space itself. There are gravitational waves coming through this room right now, and as they do, the size of this room changes. It gets shorter here and longer there, and then longer there and shorter here. 
if you want to see a three-dimensional view, it looks like a snake. But gravitational waves are so weak that we can't detect them yet. In fact, our best gravitational wave detector right now exists, this is in Washington State, and it's an amazing device. We think when two black holes collide, they'll produce massive amount of gravitational waves, but they're so weak, they're still hard to detect. In this device, there are two tunnels four kilometers long. And if a gravitational wave comes by, it'll make this line shorter than that line. So we send laser beams back and forth in both directions, and we see how long it takes them to do this and then come back, and do this and then come back. And if this length gets a little bit shorter, the time difference is very, is very much shorter. Right now, this detector is designed to be able to tell a difference in the length between these two arms, which are four kilometers long, a difference in length by an amount equal to one one-hundredth of the size of a proton. It's amazing that we can do that. The technology is amazing, but we still haven't detected gravitational waves. But we think we are on the cusp of doing that. And if we do, these waves will tell us not just about the universe was when it was 300,000 years old, but when it was a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second old. The moment of the Big Bang. And our ideas right now tell us something very interesting. At that time, we think a process called inflation happened that not only generated gravitational waves, but generated many universes. And if we're correct, our universe is just one of perhaps an infinite number of universes. And in each universe, the laws of physics may be different. In some universes, there may be stars. In other universes, there may be none. This was metaphysics, and it is still metaphysics in some sense. But what is amazing to me is in the next century, if we can empirically probe the beginning of time, we can actually empirically test for the existence of other universes and find out that not only is our universe not unique, but perhaps our universe is just an accident. And the laws of physics in our universe happen to be accidental. They're not designed for us. We will put another nail on the coffin of God, as Michael Shermer talked about yesterday. Another reason in the 22nd century we probably won't talk about it. Okay. Right now, the other place we're trying to understand the early universe is this wonderful machine in Geneva, the Large Hadron Collider, the most complicated machine humans have ever built. It's 26 kilometers around, it's got five tons of cryogenic liquid helium, and it is literally like a Gothic cathedral of the 21st century. It's taken tens of thousands of scientists decades to build this. They come from hundreds of countries, speaking dozens of languages, dozens of different religions. And that's what's wonderful about science. They all come together to build machines that look like this, that, are, that dwarf humans. This small detector has more metal in it than the Eiffel Tower. And it's designed to try and probe the fundamental structure of matter and help us reveal what the future, what the past was all about to affect the future. People often say, well, what good is any of this? And I'm reminded of the words of the first director of the first large particle accelerator in the United States. He was asked, will building this help in the defense of the nation? But he said, no, it will help keep the nation worth defending. Because it's the ideas of science, not the technology that's important. Learning about our origins and the origins of our universe affect the way we feel about ourselves. If we want to change the world, we change it by changing a picture of ourselves, like art, music, and literature, and that's what science can do. Let me go to the next frontier. The universe is one. The next is life. This is an image of, a, not a, it's a, obviously a drawing, of a large comet that may have impacted upon the planet early on, like the one that fell in Chicxulub and destroyed the dinosaurs. But what's amazing, if we try and think of our own origins of life itself, is we're learning that in comets, which have transported most of the water on Earth right now, we think, there, as we look at comets, we're discovering the basis of amino, amino acids. They're very building blocks of life, and we are trying to understand how life formed. We're not there yet. We're very close, but in the next century, I suspect, we will know how chemistry turns into biology. 
And that will be amazing because we will understand our, truly our origins and we'll see if we might be unique. We're looking in other places. Here's the Mars rovers. Looking at the surface of Mars where there once may have been water. And in fact, we now learn that no planet is an island. That material, including microbes, could be transported from one planet to another. So perhaps life originated on Mars and came to Earth. So if you want to know what Martians look like, just look in the mirror. Or we may find in the oceans of Europa life. We don't know. We are also exploring, as you've heard the other day, other solar systems. We're now learning that every star probably has a solar system around it. And we're looking for life elsewhere in the universe. And I suspect we will find evidence of life elsewhere in our solar system or in the universe in the 21st century by the 22nd century. And that will change everything because we'll learn we're not alone. Now it'll probably be microbial life. We won't know if there's intelligent life, but with a hundred billion galaxies, each containing a hundred billion stars, I'd be amazed if it's not out there. But what is amazing about life itself on Earth, and here's one of the, a picture of one of the oldest fossils of life on Earth, four billion years old from Australia. These, are, these things developed about as soon as the laws of physics allowed them to. We think natural processes could have formed those, those, those uh, uh, early life forms and we're trying to understand how it happened and when we understand how life originated we can do something else and synthetic biology right now is teaching us that the basis of life and DNA is a genetic code and we can reproduce that genetic code and here is the first artificially produced life form by my friend Craig Venter one million base pairs it's the first self reproducing bacteria based on starting with a computer code and putting the base pairs of DNA together one by one, inserting them into a life form, and changing it into a new life form. We will not only learn about the origin of life, but we'll change the meaning of life, because we'll be able to create new life forms. This may scare you, but fortune favors the prepared mind. It's going to happen. It's going to change the meaning of life. But change is not such a bad thing. We're all about changing the world. This will change the world. Whether it changes it for the better or worse depends on us. I think I'll skip teleporting life because I want to get to the final frontier. The final frontier, of course, is something you've just been hearing about and you've heard about before. The area of the universe we understand perhaps the least, the most complicated, the brain. And I suspect the 21st century leading to the 22nd century will change our understanding of the brain. Let me sh say, and we just saw beautiful images, much more beautiful than these, of the workings of a brain. But it's only the beginning and you should not be fooled. We do not understand the nature of consciousness. And if people tell you, based on brain science, that they understand what you're thinking or how you should behave, you should be highly skeptical. But it will happen eventually if it's accessible to knowledge, and I don't see any reason that it shouldn't be, that we will understand not just consciousness eventually, it's going to be a long haul, but many things that we think of as innately human. Do we have free will? What's the nature of morality? What's the nature of love? What is it to be human? These we may understand at a fundamental biochemical level. Again, that will change what's being human. Will it take the romance out of it? I don't think so. I, like Richard Feynman said, when you look at, at a rainbow and understand the physics behind it, it doesn't make the rainbow less beautiful. It makes it more beautiful. But to understand the change that's going to happen, we have to begin to understand that, the, that our brains are computers in some sense that we don't understand, but maybe by the 22nd century we will. And as our understanding of them changes, our understanding of our behavior will change. And it, it may be frightening. It may mean that we, that we understand the basis of free will. And again, I was, maybe I'll just give you in the last little bit an experiment to show you that we feel we, we know what's morally right. But psychologists have shown that, in fact, people from all different cultures are innately sort of built in to understand certain moral questions. For example, with presented with the possibility of a streetcar coming and going to be able to kill five people on this train track or one person there and asking people, would they, would they push the switch to kill one person instead of five people, people almost always agree that they would push the switch. So somehow that's built in. But if we're, they're given a very different task, which is to say the same train is coming towards to kill those five people, but you have the option of pushing a very fat person 
off, the, off a bridge to stop the train, would you do that? People say no. It's hardwired, independent of culture or background. And we don't yet understand the basis of that, that we may. And if we do, we'll understand the scientific basis of morality. And it'll change the way we have to govern ourselves and our institutions. So the universe, life, and the brain. Those are some things that may happen, but the most important thing that's going to happen is we don't know. What makes me a scientist, and what makes me so excited about being a scientist, is that every day I'm surprised if I'm not surprised. Because the universe, the imagination of the universe, far exceeds the human imagination. And therefore, we have to keep asking questions. I was very disappointed to hear yesterday when a speaker said, she said that she'd been connected to the universe and she had no more questions. If you stop questioning, you're dead. Here is the universe again. Let's remember when we try and think of the 22nd century, it, what's happened in 89 years. No one could have imagined 89 years ago a universe of 100 billion galaxies that's expanding ever faster, which is one of maybe an infinite number of universes. So when we talk about the science of the 22nd century, the only thing I can say definitively and certainly is that I have no idea what it will be. Stay tuned. Thank you very much.